In this lesson, we're going to look at reproductive adaptations. So first, let's look at the two types of reproduction, asexual and sexual. Asexual reproduction, you only need one individual, really fast and simple, but it doesn't produce any diversity. It's only producing a clone, so there's no genetic diversity. And as a result of this, it's mostly used in unicellular organisms. Here are some examples. Now notice there are some examples of multicellular animals that do it, but primarily it's unicellular organisms and plants. Plants often do this. Sexual reproduction, on the other hand, requires two and increases genetic diversity. Um, it's more complex, uh, but because we're taking and combining the genetic material from two individuals, um, we get that genetic diversity, which is so important for evolution. And as a result of this, this is mostly done in multicellular organisms. Now let's look at plants. Plants reproduce in a number of different ways. So we're going to start at the most simple. And these are spores. Spores are a form of reproduction that requires the fertilization process uh, to have water. So there has to be water there for the egg and the sperm to actually be able to get to one another. And then the spore itself doesn't have any life support system for the fertilized egg. So if it doesn't land in the exact right spot with the exact right conditions, it's not going to become a new organism. Um, it can't wait around at all. Ferns are an example of a spore plant, um, and these are the spores on the bottom of the frond. Now, a major advancement on spores are seeds. And this is what we normally think of um, with plants reproducing, because most plants are seed plants. And the big thing about the seed is that it protects that zygote, so that fertilized egg, and it provides some food and some life support systems so that if it doesn't land in the exact right spot or at the exact right time, it can at least wait a while until conditions get right so that the plant can then germinate um, and be successful. Now, within these seed plants, there's two ways that the fertilization process actually works. So we have gymnosperms, which are plants that are seed plants that are less advanced, and they have cones, um, and they're pollinated by air. So one of the ways to remember this is uh, gymnosperm is like gym. You use cones in gym. And the problem is that pollination by air it works, but it's not that efficient. You're basically just dumping out pollen and hoping that it lands in the right spot. A major advancement in seed plants was angiosperms and the uh, evolution of flowers. So these are much more advanced um, and flowers allow you to have pollination by animals. So bees and uh, birds and various other types of insects are able to take pollen directly from one plant to another. So it's much more efficient and much more direct. And this is why angiosperms, so flowering plants, are the dominant form of plant here on Earth. So apples are an obvious example, but all kinds of things are flowering plants. Even things like grass that you wouldn't necessarily think of are flowering plants. Now again, we're looking at plants moving farther from water and becoming more complex and efficient. So our spore-based plants have to be very close to water because they're not very complex and their processes require water. Once we move on to seeds, 
We get gymnosperms, which can be far from water. Um, they're not quite as complex, and they're not as efficient because they have to rely on air pollination. And then finally, we get the evolution of flowers, and we get much more efficiency through pollination by organisms. So if we look at this um, in a phylogenetic tree, the evolution of these various adaptations, first we have spores, so moss is a spore plant. Then we actually, if we go back a little bit, we have vascular tissue, because remember ferns are a vascular plant, but they also have spores. Then we get seeds, and pines are gymnosperms, and then finally we get flowers. Now let's look at animal reproduction. So animals are going to fertilize eggs in one of two ways. Externally, which is outside of the mother um, and not as efficient. And internally, which is inside the mother and much more efficient. So this is what we generally think of as fertilization. So we're going to look at animal reproduction um, and how it has advanced. So we start, we're going to start out with organisms that lay gelatinous eggs, meaning they're kind of jelly-like. Um, and these are ones that have to be in the water. They use external fertilization, and these are things like fish and amphibians. So a female fish will deposit a bunch of eggs um, on the bottom of the river, and then the male, a uh, male fish will simply deposit sperm right on top of those. That's the external fertilization part. Then we have this big advancement um, for animals in the form of shelled eggs. And this is big because it protects the egg and brings that water with it. So now we can have these eggs on land. They don't have to be in the water. But because we have this shell around it, now you can't just externally fertilize it because the sperm won't be able to get through the shell. So the egg has to be fertilized before the shell goes on, which means it has to be fertilized inside the mother. And this is going to be the case in reptiles and birds. And then finally, we have the placental form of reproduction. And this is what mammals do. It's kind of like having an egg inside the mom um, because the placenta allows the mother to actually feed and provide life support to the baby while it develops. And you can have a much more complex baby this way because you can have the baby developing for a much longer time period. So, for example, a human baby takes nine months to develop. That's not something that would be possible with an egg. Whereas a chicken, for example, takes about three weeks to develop. So a human can be much more complex because the mother is continually providing support systems to the baby while it's developing. So again, we're looking at moving this trend of moving farther from water and becoming more complex. Our gelatinous eggs, which are externally fertilized, um, have to be in the water, fairly non-complex um, system of reproduction. This is found, again, in fish and amphibians. Then as we move on to land, we're going to do internal fertilization because we have our shelled eggs. And the, remember, this shelled egg allows us to move much farther from water. Now we can actually, you know, we have reptiles that live in the desert. And we're getting a little bit more complex. And then finally, we have our placental reproductive system that allows us to live basically anywhere on Earth and be as complex as necessary because the mother is continually providing those services to the baby as it develops. We can have those very long gestation periods.
So finally, if we look at this in a phylogenetic tree, external fertilization of gelatinous eggs with our fish and amphibians, then we develop shelled eggs and have to do internal fertilization with our reptiles and birds, and then finally we evolve the placental reproductive system with mammals.